Uh, Mary received her PhD in marine biology from Scripps and is a senior research scientist at the Smithsonian Institution. She's worked in aquatic ecosystems around the world from the Amazon to Africa, has taught many university level classes, lectures frequently to lay audiences, maintains an active laboratory with graduate students and postdocs, and is a successful researcher and active grant writer and has somehow found time to call in and talk with us today. Um, in the past year, she's received several multi-million dollar research grants from government agencies and foundations to support her research and has collaborators in over 30 institutions around the world. In 2000, she received the prestigious George E. Burke uh, Fellowship in Theoretic Medicine and Affiliated Theoretic Sciences. In 2005, she was nominated for the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation and was a 2012 finalist for the Rolex Award for Enterprise. Um, she has created the first genome repository for endangered coral species in the Caribbean, Hawaii, and the Great Barrier Reef and has distributed this germplasm to frozen banks around the world. She's the director of Marine Geo Hawaii, a global nearshore long-term monitoring program. And today, Mary is going to speak with us about global ex situ conservation applied to in situ restoration techniques. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, Tom, I'm going to take off where you left off. And I, I, I think to some extent, um, what I'm going to show you today is um, the buying time and working with engineers because I've done both of those things. And, and so some of the things that you'll see are um, things that um, are really not in place yet, but I would like them to be in place. And we're working on them this summer in Hawaii um, to try and sort of prove that concept to, to folks to show that, you know, you don't want to just have banks, you want to use them and how could they be used. So we're hoping that in the near future, um, we can get a lot more stuff out on the reefs that um, have uh, been cryopreserved, especially if they're endangered or if there's a, a small population that needs um, uh, attending to. Um, so thank you to the um, Global um, Restoration Project and to some of my collaborators. Um, this is certainly um, not done by myself, um, and there's many people around the world who help us. So um, I think the thing that the, the thing that's good to keep in mind is that corals are both animals and habitat. And when you think about corals physiologically, I think sometimes people think of them too much like habitat in terms of them being rocks or that they follow equations. But I think one of the things that I, I really want to point out today in, in my talk is um, not only some of the new techniques that we're developing or have developed, but also um, the, the level of stress and what it means to reproduction. Um, and um, I think we're blithely uh, uh, accepting that we're going to have reproduction um, in, in these populations for the next 20 or 30 years, and, and I, I'm not entirely sure that's going to be the case. So um, as I I'm, I'm, I'm have a few um, slides that are um, that probably many people have seen, but I, I don't didn't know who was going to be online, so I just had a few back, you know, background slides. So I think everyone knows that coral reefs are um, endangered and threatened um, in every ocean around the world. And certainly um, one of the things that I thought I would never say is that um, today, two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef is um, uh, either dead or severely bleached, and, and that is staggering to me to think about that. Um, and it's, it's, it's really unthinkable. Um, we live on an ocean planet, and 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean, so we really need to be focused on maintaining you know, our ecosystems and our ocean and managing them. And I, I, I think Tom's Tom's ideas about scaling up are, are absolutely spot on, but we also have to think smartly about how we manage those ecosystems. And oftentimes, you know, I work at, I work at a zoo and the, all those animal populations are completely managed, but somehow with coral reefs, we've held off from wanting to manage and wanting to do, do things that are interventionist. And I think it has been um, to the detriment, especially in the Caribbean, of those ecosystems. Certainly, we know that, you know, as coral reefs degrade, um, fish populations are decreasing and um, hunger um, um, is going to be uh, increased and food will be, uh, fish will become a luxury item. As many people know, this is just a, a, you know, sort of a, a summary of, of what's happening and what the global problems are. It's our lust for carbon dioxide, um, we, you know, or, or I should say, not our lust for carbon dioxide, our lust for um, car fossil fuels. And that's producing carbon dioxide, which is both warming and acidifying our oceans. But the, the, the key for all of this for the coral is that it's causing stress, it's causing bleaching, disease, and, and can cause death. 
Um, but it's the stress that I think is really, um, we, we, we don't understand completely. Um, but surely if you look at, you know, some of this data from NOAA, um, you can see that, you know, from say the 1980s to 1997 or 1998, there are about 370 bleaching events. And then um, there was um, a global bleaching event that caused 15% of the world's coral to die. And um, then um, since that time, we've had almost a tenfold increase in bleaching events. And so that has, that that increase in bleaching event ha is having a huge impact on, on reproduction. So I'm going to start off with what I do um, in the buying time <laughs> mode, and that is um, to, to think about cryopreserving coral. And um, uh, so I, we started this program in 2004 in Hawaii. We chose Hawaii because of the extended um, breeding season there. Um, there aren't many species there. We don't have a lot of diversity, perhaps 10 species in the main Hawaiian islands. And we actually don't even know how, you know, we only know a handful that when they breed. Um, but they do breed from April to September. So that gives us a lot more time to um, work on the physiology. And um, I work in Kaneohe Bay here. And um, the great thing about Kaneohe Bay is it's small, but it has a lot of patch reefs. And, and there's, there's, there's generally, depending on the species you're working on, pretty decent um, uh, uh, species um, genetic diversity still and then just you know for those of you who have never seen sort of the sequence that goes from the coral egg to you know what getting a settled coral you fertilize the egg and then it develops into this odd shaped embryo that turns into a swimming planula and then it metamorphoses and settles and then you, you have a coral the species we've often worked with is the um, mushroom coral because it's it will spawn um, five months out of the year, and it gives us a, a wide, it gives us vast numbers of eggs and sperm, and they're separate. The, it, the, they're not, well, they're sequential hermaphrodites. Um, so sometimes they're males and sometimes they're females, but they don't produce generally eggs and sperm in, once, in one individual. But we also bring in fragments, and um, those will spawn in captivity as well. And um, we will isolate individuals and collect their egg sperm bundles, or we'll, we will put um, nets over them and collect eggs from bundles in our 50 mil tubes. So um, what are some of the solutions and challenges uh, for cryopreserving reefs? Um, and some of this is taken from humans. Uh, humans, so the first cryopreservation was in, in 19, um, the 1950s, um, and um, the first human um, sperm was cryopreserved in the 1960s, the first human emb embryo in the 1980s, and the first human egg in the in in the late um, 1990s. Now, part of this time difference has to do with the complexity of those tissues. Sperm are small; it's relatively easy to to um, to cryopreserve. Embryos are more complicated, and they're much larger. And eggs have a lot of fat in them, which can complicate um, the cryopreservation. And they're also much larger. And so we've taken a page from human um, IVF clinics and, and um, basically created our own equipment um, to cryopreserve uh, coral sperm. And, and my assistant, Jenny, here is in. We actually make, we have very simple tools that we use so that people around the world can use them. They're just, it's just basically styrofoam, uh, you know, a pool of styrofoam, a pool of liquid nitrogen in styrofoam. And we have <laughs> flip-flops that float on the surface of this liquid nitrogen and then cryo canes that hold our cryo tubes, if you see up in the corner. Um, and that, that allows the, the, the cryo tubes to freeze at 20 degrees per minute. And this rate has been used um, for all species to date. So it's not like there's some um, cat species and a variety of other species that you have to develop a cryopreservation protocol for every single species, but that has not been true um, for coral. So to date, um, we have um, 15 um, species that are banked around the world from the Caribbean, Hawaii, and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but these are held in uh, institutions that need a lot of help. Uh, the Smithsonian doesn't hold any of them yet. The USDA has, has been very generous in, in holding the Caribbean coral for us and has, do, has done that free of charge. Um, and uh, they hold the Hawaiian coral as well. The Great Barrier Reef coral is um, held by Taranga Zoo, and it is in the middle of the desert in a container. <laughs> so again, um, you know, in addition to, you know, a lot of 
you know, engineering things that we need to uh, enhance for the ocean for biosecurity and, and maintaining biodiversity of these really critical populations. There are some infrastructure uh, things that need to be done to help maintain some of this biodiversity. And one thing that's really good is that if you have 35 coral adults um, and you, you can collect their sperm from them, you, you can maintain about 90% of the diversity in that population. So it is, it, you don't need to have thousands and thousands of, species, of individuals for a, a population that you're trying to secure. So it's, it's a very, I think, manageable um, uh, process. And this is just a, to give you a, an artist's rendition of what you know, a coral bank might look like. And it's often very hard for people to understand what a bank looks like and how you would use it. But often the best way to think about it is really seed bank. And we've had seed banks for thousands of years and, and we, we store seeds, we use seeds, we take seeds out and we put them back in. And that's really what I would like to advocate for anything that we're banking is that they be used and that we are constantly putting things in and taking them out, whether we're using them for science or we're using them for research. And certainly there'll be certain ar archival populations that you'll want as well. But these, these banks should be all over the world and they should be nodal and they should be in parallel with, with other institutions so that perhaps I, you know, the United States holds some of the Great Barrier Reef uh, um, uh, coral as well or the Middle Eastern coral or whatever. So there, there is parallel processes. So what can we do with these banks today? Um, we can thaw out the sperm, um, which you see David Abrego there with a, some thawed um, uh, coral sperm. And we have some fresh coral eggs in front of us. And we can create um, new coral babies with those. Um, generally, what we'll do is we, we will rear them up in, in these um, conical tanks. We can um, do hundreds of thousands in these really small um, conical tanks that we've got at HIMV. Um, and um, as I said, you, we can um, get them so that they'll settle. And um, the one on the left is from, produced from spe fresh sperm, and the one on the right is produced from cryopreserved sperm. And you can see that they have also taken up their symbiodinium. Um, so, um, you know, this is all very good news um, until bleaching started entering the, um, the scene in, in Hawaii. Um, so in 2014, at the sort of in October of 2014, we, we began our bleaching, and it went through 2015. And, and this is just an image of you know differences in in, in uh, um, individuals on on the reef. But we had a lot of um, historical data that we had collected. Now, what you're looking at is sperm motility of coral on the on the y-axis, and then time on the the x-axis. And um, I, I would I would like to to suggest that people start thinking about collecting sperm motility, because it is probably one of the most sensitive things to happen during bleaching. We looked at many reproductive characteristics, and, and some of them shifted. But in the two species that we ha both had, it's not longitudinal. I mean, large amount of, of, of data, but it's still you know multiple years that we can look at. And you can see um, that in 2015, when we examined sperm motility in both mushroom coral and um, uh, Montipra capitata, that we were almost in half in terms of its um, uh, sperm motility. What that means in, you know, in the wild is that you're getting less, you know, reproduction, you're getting less, fewer larvae, you're getting fewer settle, settlers, et cetera, et cetera. But this rippled down, especially in, in terms of um, uh, in our in vitro system, it rippled down in terms of, we saw differences in, in terms of egg size, we saw differences in terms of um, uh, larval development, um, we didn't see any difference in terms of uh, symbiodinium uptake, but one of the major differences that we saw is that because we're starting out at such a low point, say 35% sperm motility at best, we really couldn't cryopreserve um, because cryopreservation, you know, damages sperm and um, you have to compensate for that. It's true in humans as well. If a, if a human male walks into a clinic and his sperm motility is less than 50%, they won't take him as a donor. Um, and so for coral, um, we saw, if you look on the left, you can see the fertilization success that we got with cryopreserved sperm. It was really quite terrible. And um, on, the, on the right, um, you can see that the, the post-fertilization development was terrible. Um, and the open opens, um, symbols are that cryopreserved, um, the larvae we made with uh, cryopreserved um, sperm. So the, it, 
the change, you know, as we as bleaching now becomes more and more common, it is really going to impact our ability to use these methods um, to save coral. And and for me, this was this was this was really um, quite disturbing. Um, so in addition, the the other things that we are cryopreserving are um, symbiodinium, and um, so we've uh, been able to pull symbiodinium out of uh, the, the, the out of the coral tissue and cryopreserve it and um, we're now working with Madeline and Ames to uh, look at whether we can get these um, we can do the same thing for cultured symbiodinium and, and cryopreserve them as well um, this summer we'll be looking at whether we can get these cryopreserved and thawed uh, symbiodinum to be taken up by the larvae. So that will be key in terms of forming a global bank. I think this is another really important aspect. Um, Ames has a fantastic culture facility, but they don't actually um, preserve as many um, symbi symbiodinum clades as are out there. And they're one of the few groups that can do it quite well. Um, and they do, you know, and so I think having a frozen collection is again key to um, using these cells um, in the future for a variety of different kinds of um, research approaches for conservation. The other thing that we're, we're looking at is um, freezing fish and um, we're doing it in a number of ways um, because it's, coral reefs need fish obviously and we're using um, a technique that was developed by um, a group of colleagues in, in Japan and what they're doing is they're taking advantage of the fact that fish have both stem cells that can turn into test into males and females, so you can produce ovaries or testes from the same uh, stem cells. And what they do, um, if you look at this graphic, is they they will take out a testes, and we we actually cryopreserve the whole testes. It, it, um, and it's a one-step process. You just put it into the cryoprotection solution, and then you freeze it very slowly, and, and then you put it in liquid nitrogen. So it's it's very simple. We can train anyone to do it in about a half hour as long as you have the solutions. And um, then later what they did is they took um, they took sterile hosts, and that you see the little sal salmon there, and they injected those thawed stem cells into the, into the sterile hosts. And those sterile hosts, which are surrogates, produced either testes or, ov or, or eggs from the donor. And so you, and you don't even have to have the, the fish alive anymore because you can use fish from the same genus. So we're now applying this to coral reefs, and we, we're, we're using it um, in Hawaii here. We, we have it. Um, we have samples now from gobies, and we're, we'll be doing a number of other species over the next uh, few months um, here in Hawaii. So um, I think a point that we want to, I, I would like to make, is that bleaching affects not only um, today's coral in terms of stressing or perhaps killing them, but also future coral by reducing survivor, survivor's reproduction. And that, to me, is, is going to be key in how we think about we, the, the, the ways we can move forward. Um, you know, we can, um, we can do a number of things that, that, that can try and enhance some of these things, and we can settle coral on these plugs. That's where I think, you know, I, I, I heard what Tom said about you know, uh, things need to go right onto the reef. But for some of this research stuff, the tree, coral trees are, are, are an amazing way to grow and, and, and um, grow fragments. But for us, they'll be an amazing way, hopefully, to grow out larvae that we've cryopreserved um, and to prove the concept that we can get cryopreserved um, corals out onto the reef. And that's something we hope to do this summer is, is um, get a large population of cryopreserved corals um, onto trees and also onto the reef and compare their growth and predation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we just started uh, started a, a tree project in Morea and in Hawaii. And um, we will be using these trees um, not only for reproductive coral, both fresh and cryopreserved, but we also would like to um, uh, start putting um, microfragments. Um, these are pictures from Chris Page's um, tanks in, at Moat Marine, Moat Marine Lab, and Chris will be coming out this summer. Um, we can actually cryopreserve um, the fragments of coral, but we're not. We, we use much bigger fragments than what Chris typically produces, and um, the the fragments that we cryopreserved lasted about four days and then died. So we're hoping by bringing the size down of the fragment 
and using some other techniques, which I'll show you in the next slide, that we'll be able to um, start freezing microfragments and, and getting them out onto trees. Um, the thing that, that's important for us in this is that we are getting skunked um, by reproduction. Our project in Morea, there, there was a bleaching event in 2016. We, had, we went there for four months and um, six species of corals. Morea has a very similar type of uh, reproductive pattern as, as Hawaii in that it's very distributed. So four species over six months and the sperm motility and our larval output was was really impacted. Our sperm motility was less than 30% generally in, on all the species. And one species didn't spawn at all, even though we, we could see that it had it was full of eggs. So the, the microfragments will allow us, um, if we can get this to work, to start working around the around, you know, in all seasons and in, in every um, um, coral reef around the world. We won't have to wait for reproduction, which is a very limiting. So the other things that we're developing are ways to, to cryopreserve coral eggs and larvae, because many people want these, um, to be able to just pull these out of the freezer and, and to use them. So um, this is data um, from uh, uh, a paper that will be coming out in the next couple weeks, um, Koshla et al., where um, we cryopreserved um, fish embryos. Now, fish embryos are huge. This is a zebrafish embryo. And I, I told you that human embryos were much more difficult to cryopreserve than sperm. And we've been, I've been actually working on this for 20 years, and we just got this to work. And the way we got it to work was we, we actually had to microinject the, the cryoprotectant into the, the, uh, the larvae or the embryo. And we actually in, injected um, gold nano rods into the um, embryo. We then froze it um, in liquid nitrogen just by immersing it in liquid nitrogen. But the key to, to this was using a laser. If you take, just take the, the embryo out of the, the, the liquid nitrogen, if you look to the left on D, it'll form ice crystals and die. But if you hit it with a laser, um, you, you warm it at 10 million degrees per minute. And then the embryo, you, you stop the, um, the growth of ice crystals that often form when the um, embryo is, is thawing. And so we now have about 10% of our fish embryos that are living afterwards. Um, and this is a huge success because people have been trying to do this for, for 60 years. And so we're very confident. We, we're set up now um, to do uh, coral, coral eggs and embryos this summer. We have our, our laser in place, and we're just waiting for the spawning season now to start up. So I think this will be a, a major advancement for a lot of the, the things that people want to do with assisted evolution um, in terms of having eggs, sperm, and embryos available. So um, just in summary, um, you know that coral reefs around the world are in trouble. But at the Smithsonian, we're trying to create frozen repositories and use, use cutting edge technology to try and provide um, you know, uh, uh, material for offshore nurseries to help maintain reef biodiversity. So again, you know, I think this is the key to um, everything that we're doing is that we need to preserve um, our reef biodiversity while it it still exists, and we think that frozen banks, in in in, con in conjunction with coral nurseries, can can really help offset some of the deficits that we're seeing, especially as we go to larger and larger processes for um, restoration. So I'll say thank you and ask if there's any questions at this time. Wonderful, that was fascinating. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, sure. I'm just screening through the online questions. Are there any questions from participants in the room? We do have one question that was submitted from Ileana, actually, who I think is no longer online. And you kind of touched on this, but um, I don't know if you want to add anything more. She's asking uh, about cryopreservation of symbiodinium for species that we cannot yet culture. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add on that, other than what you already said? No, no, I think I think we're well in hand with that. Um, we'll, we'll definitely, um, we're simplifying the procedures and, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that not only um, we can cryopreserve all types of acroporid and other types of symbiodinium, but also cultured symbiodinium and also making sure that the symbiodinium is palatable and when it, once, once it's thawed and that the coral larvae can actually take it up. So once we've, we've shown that, I think um, it will be a very good tool and we can rapidly go around the world and make banks that can be very um, user friendly. Yeah, we have one question from Tom. Just one. Hey, Mary, I'm curious if you have any thoughts or have started at all to kind of categorize any of the 
phenotypic char characteristics of the corals that you currently have sperm for? No, um, actually, not not at all. I mean, we do actually. I take it back. Um, so we we cryopreserved all the individuals, or many of the individuals that spawned in, in Ken's um, nursery last year. So we have about 29 individuals from his. Um, so we do we do two things. We do pooled, which is better for conservation, and we do individuals, which is better for research. Um, so for his 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 groupings, because we knew the um, the um, genetic um, makeup of the individuals we did we did individual um, individually cryopreserved and some of his that are fantastic we <laughs> we did a lot of them so um, there are about um, I don't know 500 or so samples in, in USDA from 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 those uh, 29 or so individuals from from his from his uh, nursery and the other thing I, I just want to add to this um, having a nursery and having the, those sorts of things already characterized we can move so fast. We did that in one week, you know, and, and and we can move really fast once we know all that stuff. But if we have to do it all ourselves, it can take us years, you know, and it just it slows down the whole process. So I would still put a plug in for the nurseries because I think they're really important for um, helping the newer tools that are going to come online to keep corals going, you know, and so the, the, the nurseries really can help us out with that. And, and especially since they were genetically identified, that was fantastic. Um, and then I have a question. You mentioned that your repositories are currently being held in institutions that really need a lot of support. And so what would your kind of institutional wish list look like in an ideal scenario in terms of where you would deposit these um, and what kind of support you would need? Right. So, um, you know, I think that, I mean, USDA really did it right. You know, if you if you go to their animal germplasm repository, it's amazing. Um, it's in a, it's in a facility that can withstand a, a class five hurricane. Um, so it's, it's a very secure building. They have a great deal of redundancy. They have self-filling tanks. Um, and their, their idea is that they, they hold, and it has to be an institution that's going to last hundreds of years, right? So um, the, or at least, at least 50, you know, we don't want to, and, you know, so it's, it's almost got, has to be a federal agency, you know, and it has to be, there has to be redundancy and there has to be nodes, you know, for instance, Indonesia may not want to give out their genetic material, and we, we would certainly be happy to create a bank for them, but I would urge them in the future as they got more, you know, sort of um, sophisticated in banking to think about having a backup bank, say, in Australia or someplace like that, where the material is still theirs, but it's just being held by another institution, and um, having those kinds of um, collaborations can really make a difference if, if the, you know, if someplace is hit by a hurricane or a tornado or, or whatever, you know, you just, you just never know. Sure. Um, we do have a, a question being submitted online. Uh, how long are cry can cryos be stored and still be viable? Oh, it's a really good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, you know, so the data we have right now is 60 years or so, right, because it's only started in really 1959 or something like that. But theoretically, it can last for hundreds of years, two thousands of years. Um, no one's tested it that long, but certainly hundreds of years, and that gives us the kind of time that we might need to um, to 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 you know maintain them and also uh, use them in uh, a particularly uh, um, interactive way, you know, for restoration. Perfect. I'm just searching through. Do we have any more? Oh, if you cryopreserve eggs and sperm for corals, what happened with the symbiont? Um, I guess they're asking if maybe if the eggs uh, already have. Yeah. So 35% of, uh, of corals have a vertical um, transmission of their symbionts. And so we have not cryopreserved, well, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't cryopreserved eggs yet, but I'm thinking that because when we cryopreserve eggs, we're going to be moving so fast, we'll be, we'll be freezing and thawing them at millions of degrees that the symbionts will be completely happy. They, they need fast freezing and thawing, and, and the way we will do it, I think, will be fine. Um, you, you touched on something that I thought was important. I've forgotten what it is. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So that, that's oh, one, 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 one question that people ask all the time is, you know, if you're, you're freezing sperm now, you know, and 
the, the ocean is going to hell in a handbag. And why would you want to why would you want to put your coral back out into you know an ocean that's changed? And why, what are you going to do with just sperm? And and that, the thing that I would I would urge people to think about is not get stuck in a box today. You know we have no idea in a hundred years what science is going to be able to do with even just sperm. You know, you can imagine, you know, 100 years ago, we had no idea that we'd be doing genetics and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, there may be, we may be doing synthetic science then. We may be creating coral just from their DNA sequence. So even if we could only do their, 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 um, their sperm, you know, which is a perfect genomic copy, I mean, it is, it has everything because the cell is alive, right? So it's got everything except the mitochondria, of course, the, the, the female mitochondria, but it's got a perfect DNA copy. And so, you know, this in itself is extremely valuable as um, a resource for the future. And then another question coming in asking, do you think that if environmental conditions continue to change, <laughs> do you think larvae from cryo would be able to adapt to new conditions? Um, you know, I surely do not know the answer, but the great thing about a lot of this is that as, you know, um, uh, nurseries and um, restoration groups get going, they will know, you know, the individuals that are, are very robust and we can selectively breed. Um, you know, those individuals so that their offspring um, might be able to be more robust to towards those changes in the ocean. <laughs>